This is a Regain Wellness Podcast with Jamie Logie, episode 140. Should you still make a New Year's resolution? Hey guys, what's happening? Welcome back to the podcast. I'm Jamie Logie. I run regainwellness.com. And this is the Regain Wellness Podcast. So welcome. Happy 2018. If you're new here, very special welcome. Thanks for coming on out. I do podcasts on all sorts of things related to health, fitness. I've interviewed some amazing guests. You can just go back and look and check out. I've covered everything you probably want to know or learn about uh, as far as anything like nutrition, diet, everything like that. So, I mean, if you haven't already, make sure you subscribe wherever you get your podcast, probably on iTunes, but I don't know where we get them. Find them in the woods, down the street, anywhere you get them. Subscribe that way you automatically get them delivered to you. So this show, I put this off a little bit just because a combination of two things. I was sick as a dog after the new year and I wanted to give it a little, I probably still sound a little sick, but I'm not too bad. And I also wanted to give it a little bit of time because I'm talking about the whole new year's resolution thing. And you're, you know, you're bombarded with all that sort of information immediately when the new year hits. So I wanted to give it a little bit of time um, and now address it where you might have a little more chance to take, you know, take it in, absorb it a little better as opposed to being like bombarded with a ton of info. So in the show, I'm going to go over the whole deal and kind of pros and cons if New Year's resolutions are worth it, um, what the plus side is, what the downside is, and then a bunch of tips actually on how to get started if you're looking to improve like your diet, your health, your wellness, everything like that. So I'll sort of lay it out the best way I see that is the best way to make it stick and work. Okay, let's get right to it. So I wanted to actually start with a few New Year's fun facts because everyone loves fun facts. I always thought this is interesting as you've watched, probably watched the ball drop in Times Square and that's, you know, sort of the unofficial kickoff i mean you know the various times that new year starts around the world but it's kind of seen as you know when it's in times square is the the big event i was there one year in i think it was 2008 maybe nine and it was chaos we were so far if you know new york and where times square is we were back by carnegie hall that's how far back and we were probably halfway um but basically so people have been celebrating New Year's in Times Square as early as around 1904, but it was in 1907 that the New Year's Eve ball made its first descent because um, Times Square is named after the New York Times when they relocated up there. Before that, it was called Long Acre Square. And that was just part of the festivities that year that they were going to lower the ball and this, you know, it was this actual lit up 700 pound thing and it was just going to be, um, to signify the move there and then the fact that it was just the change over into the year. So it started with sort of not like a promotional thing, but, you know, along those lines. And another thing I I find interesting, I'm not sure if people do too, is the, the idea behind singing Old Lang Syne at um, midnight and where that goes back to, which it's an old Scottish um, kind of poem, I guess, that was made popular by... Guy Lombardo, who's actually from my hometown, London, Ontario. And it was a song that they made pretty much famous. And it was, they used to do a radio show in New York and they started that in 1929. And they were, this is kind of like, they didn't have, you know, Dick Clark, Dick Clark's rock and New Year's Eve. So people would like listen to the radio. And that first year they played at it just happened to be at midnight they played old lang syne and that was like here in western ontario there's a big scottish population and when bands would finish dances they would always finish with old lang syne it's just i don't know where it came from it's just something they started to do so guy lombardo had been playing this for a long time so then when they moved to new york the first time they did this radio show um, they finished the show at midnight and just as was natural, they would play Old Lang Syne like they would everywhere, you know, else back home. And that just, you know, to them, it was sort of just a random, I don't know, it's like playing, not exactly, but like, you know, dances or weddings playing like the YMCA at some point. It was just kind of like 
the not cheesy but novelty type song and um yeah that's kind of where it came from and then continued and became their theme song theme song and it became like new year's theme song too okay let's get to the actual fitness health stuff so i'll get sort of the cons out of the way of the idea with new year's resolutions <clears throat> and there, there's a bunch and it's you know traditionally at the top of people's list statistically are things like lose weight's always number one um exercise more eat better quit smoking lower stress you know stuff like that and it's it's a little tough because the stats really aren't on your side as around i mean almost 80 plus percent of people are not going to keep a resolution and if they do it's going to only last till usually march is sort of the cutoff time as far as um, you know, following through on it, it's when the, if you've been in gyms, work in gyms or whatever, that's where they, you know, they're packed obviously right into January and around March, it starts to level out as people fall away. It's around only 8% of people actually stick statistically with New Year's resolutions. So, you know, from that standpoint, you know, the odds aren't on your side. Then there is the, the expectation that you have to start it in January. So you, you put more pressure on yourself where there's no rule it has to start in January. It's just sort of an arbitrary date we made up. And it's just to us and society, it signals the start of, of the new year. But there's no, you know, th these things can happen anytime. I always like to say September is more of a new year um, compared to January because it's out of the summer. It's when, you know, you get back into routines and schedules and, you know, the changes in the weather. But like here, it's a little different depending on where you live. If you live in the east coast of North America, we've been... Basically, I didn't leave my house for three days. That's how much snow and blizzard we've had. This has been a winter like I haven't seen in decades as far as cold temperatures. It was down to minus 27 Celsius one night where you can take a glass of boiling water and throw it and it just evaporates into snow in the air. And I did that a few times. So, I mean, we're so cooped up. It's so hard to get back into routine it's hard enough to get back to work like in my city uh what day was monday was january 1st people were back on the tuesday most people could they still were shutting schools and work because like even snow plows couldn't get out on the road so it's kind of a nightmare compared to say where september the weather's still nice it starts to get a little cooler you still feel a little more productive and active you have more exposure to you know fresh you know sunlight and air and it can it sort of seamlessly transitions. So the combination of the weather and the environment makes it um, like trying to get to the gym is basically it can be impossible. Like today, where I record this podcast, I had to walk here because you just could not drive on the roads anywhere. So it just handcuffs you as far as you know trying to get moving. And even if you are you're super motivated and excited, you know you can be you know flipped up over or tripped up over this whole thing. And to me, the biggest con of a New Year's resolution is the idea that people have to take on way too much all at once. And that's what's going to lead to burnout, whether it's in the new year or in September or in the spring or whenever you're like taking on. It doesn't even have to be like fitness or exercise or whatever. Anytime you overwhelm yourself, you overstress yourself and you set yourself up for, you know, really almost guaranteed failure. Your body... Um, just doesn't do well with an avalanche of different changes and, and habit switches. It needs a little more stability and a little more consistency. So if you've gone from doing zero exercise to trying to do marathon training sessions seven days a week and you've been eating, you know, just random junk and nothing special and you're trying to eat, you know, kale and boiled chicken five times a day, it's it's going to be impossible for you. So anytime you take on too much, it's a surefire way for it to just not end up, um, you know, going the way you want it to. And I'll get to this in a little bit about how to make smaller changes and what those gradual smaller changes should look like when it comes to improving your health and your wellness. Here's a few pros I find behind it. Like I, I've been back and forth. I was always one of those people who is just like New Year's resolutions are stupid. There's no point. They're only going to lead in failure. Like that's not very encouraging. And I still think they actually, as much as 
it depends on sort of the flavor of the year. You know, some years you'll see more encouragement and more motivation to like make changes and get healthy and whatever. And then some years it's like they don't bother news resolutions are pointless and fail. It just, it kind of depends what the mindset is at the time. But so as much criticism as they get, I, I do think they still serve a purpose in a few ways and that at the very least, it's a reminder for you to <clears throat> kind of get your ass in gear. It's, you know, it can be easier to ignore messages to get healthy at other points in the year, but there's really no ignoring it come January because it's everywhere, whether it's, you know, newspapers, magazines, online, blogs, articles, whatever. It That's just going to be the hot topic, whatever. So it's going to be there. And it's even if it's a, a sense of um, kind of like a little nagging voice in the back of your head or if it makes you uncomfortable, like thinking you have to make a change. The exposure to that message, I think, can be helpful. Sometimes it needs that um, that bit of, you know, out of your comfort zone, uncomfortableness reminder that you need to make a change. So at the very least, like if, you know, if it's bypassed you year after year, there might be that one year where it kicks in. You know what I mean? It finally sort of sinks. And, you know, hopefully if you, if you have been looking to make health changes and that's why you're listening to this podcast, hopefully this year is that year where it finally does start to kick in. I mean, there, there's, like I said, there's tons of great times to start, but you can be guaranteed like clockwork every January, there's going to be that reminder. And I think you can use that um, to your benefit. The, the main thing is no matter when you decide to make the healthier choices now I'll get into, it's not, you know, that idea of not taking too much on all at once. You want to build up. It's not about adapting and just like creating a new diet. That's kind of a bad way to look at it. It's more health is about making behavioral changes and you need that little bit of time to build them. It, it's nothing that you can do in a week or a weekend. You got to be looking at it from almost, you know, like three, four or five different months that like start picturing things in like May and June. And that's when it's sort of going to take hold and you want to build yourself up to that point. And anytime you're adapting a new habit, it's going to take a little bit of time. You've probably heard the idea that it takes 21 days to create a habit and no one really knows where that comes from, but it's something we all seem to know, but it actually, it has its roots in um, a book from the 1950s by a Beverly Hills plastic surgeon. And he was writing about the changes and the trend, like when plastic surgery was becoming more of a bigger thing and people are starting to change their appearance. And he noticed that, you know, people are having a full facelift or changes, you know, they, they start to look in the mirror and they're like, whoa, what the hell? Like, you know, it's whether it looks good or bad, they notice there's a now significant difference. And he noticed it took around 21 days for them to start getting used to what they were seeing. And for some reason, the sort of, um, psycho pop analysts at the time or whatever sort of jumped on this thing and thought that it relates to all different habits and that, oh, 21 days it takes to form a habit when that's really not the case. He was just saying that around this 21 day point, people started to settle in a little bit more. And that's not actually related to a habit. That was just more with how they were comfortable with their appearance. In reality, it can take upwards of like six weeks before habit be can, uh, can become ingrained in you. So when we're looking at building habits, it does take quite a lot of time. But when you're starting with smaller, simpler things, uh, I think you have a little more leeway as far as not having to, you know, do one thing and, you know, take six weeks to do it before adding in another. Because when it comes to your health, there's a lot of things that you do on a daily basis. You're still going to eat. You're still going to drink water. You're still going to prepare meals. So it's just sort of, um, you know, customizing that a little bit different and using the the abilities and the, you know, the normal day-to-day -day activities you're already going to do. Um, and then that way you don't have to, you know, necessarily take that three weeks or that six weeks to do it as opposed to if you're starting like a, if you're trying to like, I don't know, juggle every day and you've never done it before, it's going to take a long time before it becomes second nature and habit. But when it's, when it comes to things of daily life, I think you can get away with a little less time. And that's what I'm going to talk about here is about starting with a new habit, um, a healthy behavioral change and doing it for like a week or two before you move on 
into another new habit. And so that way you're adopting them slowly and you're not overwhelming yourself with like 25 different changes that you're doing immediately. You're sort of doing one at a time and then building them up. And think about that long-term goal of May or June when you've now adapted, you know, all these hopefully healthy, better changes that have become sort of second nature and that you can hopefully do without even thinking. So I'm going to talk about diet and nutrition based habits, and then I'll sort of touch on fitness and things like that in a little bit. But the the biggest changes you can make to your health are going to start with your diet. Exercise is very good and very important, has its place, but it's not going to overhaul things as much as changing your nutrition is. And there's that phrase that you can't out train a bad diet. And that's very true. And I've tried it and it just does not happen. So when you start with your diet and nutrition and get all that up to speed, the, um, the, the exercise and the fitness will then kind of feed off that. And hopefully, you know, if you're working out now and everything, that's perfect. And maybe some of this stuff can be um, you know, if you've already been on top of all your nutrition, maybe this will be a refresher if you need it. And like I said, if you're brand new to everything, these are some sort of good things you can start with. So I'm going to kind of lay these out kind of in a particular order, but not written in stone. Um, the first thing I would say that you want to do to adopt for a new habit is to focus on hydration and to start your day off with the first thing you do, I mean, you know, whatever, get up, go to the bathroom, whatever, but to have a good large glass or two of water. So this is just, I mean, th these are simple things, right? So they're going to start simple and they're going to get more complex as they go. Um, and it's about starting with the things that are more manageable. So you're not going, you know, too overwhelmed right off the bat. So when you start the day off with um, this hydration, it's going to help your body wake up. It's going to start cleansing it's i mean basically you've been dehydrated for eight hours and you're going to need water to function your best it's you know for, not just from hydration but all the different um, bodily functions that require water from like digestion absorption transport of nutrients circulation um, body temperature control regulation cognitive function the whole deal so when you wake up a glass or two of water first thing you do you don't want to chug it you want to sip it no chugging, you're not a frat party. You want to, um, you know, and you don't want it too cold as well too, just sort of like lukewarm. To really make it a little bit better, you can squeeze in some fresh lemon, maybe half a lemon, and that's going to add in more um, detoxifying benefits, cleansing, it's going to help with digestion. And okay, so that's the first one. You want to do that for, you know, like a week or two, just so it's, you know, a regular thing and then you start doing it without thinking. The next um, tip is going to be along with the hydration is to increase your overall daily water intake. Like I said, so many people are walking around in a state of dehydration and that's not only affecting how your body functions, like with those things I just said, but um, <clears throat> your energy levels, your mood, it's a lot of it's related. A lot of time hunger signals or sorry, people confuse hunger signals for dehydration. And a lot of people sometimes are overeating due to the fact they're actually dehydrated when your body just needed um, the water as opposed to turning to whatever thing you start eating. So with all those things in mind, your goal now is to drink half your body weight. So pounds of, so if you do kilograms or stone, if you're weird, like the English people, find out what that is in pounds, divide it in half. And that's how many ounces of water you want to drink over the course of a day. So now if you have been doing this you know, large glass or two of water to start the day, you're already sort of underway, you know, and if you haven't been having any good water intake or you've become aware that you're not drinking enough, you don't want to start all this off right away. You want to, you know, slowly add a, a glass or two over a couple of days and let it build up. But that works out because this is a new habit that you can take a week or two to do. So instead of going, so say like you're 150 pounds, Divide in half. Let me check my calculator. I'm kidding. Figure that out. 75 pounds. So that's 75 ounces of water a day. When there's around eight ounces in a cup of water, um, that's, you know, around eight or nine cups. But the average, average large glass can hold maybe, say, two of those. So it's really not that much. But over the course of a week or two, if you haven't been drinking a lot of water, um, you know, do those few in the morning, do a couple more in the afternoon and do that for a few days and then add in another. And it doesn't take too long to get it up. You might find yourself going to the bathroom a little bit more, which is good. Uh, but 
that sort of tapers and evens itself off after a couple of weeks, which works out pretty well. The next tip I would say is to, and I talk about this all the time, is to slow down the amount of time it takes you to finish a meal. So see with these tips right now, we're not even adding in anything. We're not even making changes. We're just like adapting what we're doing. So that's why these are a little more doable and you're more likely to stick with them because we haven't even done any crazy overhaul stuff yet. We're, we're, we're not even, we're, you're still eating the same foods. The point here is to slow down because the average person is finishing their meals in around three to five minutes. And a lot of times even quicker. Think how fast you're probably eating a lot quicker than you realize. Keep an eye on it when you're, some people are finishing meals in like 30 to 40 seconds. And I'm sure you have, I know I have too, whether you're on the run or it's in the car or whatever. So the problem with that is eating too fast overwhelms your digestive system. It makes things really harsh um, to digest. It can lead to gastrointestinal issues, cramping, bloating, gas, nausea, the whole deal. So just from a physical you know, how you feel standpoint and digestion and everything actually starts in the mouth. That's why you want to take longer to chew your food. It's going to start breaking it down. So when it starts to digest actually inside you, it's a little easier on your system because it's already underway. But so that's just with how you feel. The, the real issue here is this is what's making people overeat quite a lot. When you eat too fast, you have, you know, kind of natural fullness signals that are connected from the stomach to the brain. You have like these stretch receptors on your stomach and basically your, your gastrointestinal system, your stomach, everything kind of is always connected with your brain. When you eat too fast, you kind of hijack those signals and you don't allow them to, you know, to really reach the brain. So you may have eaten enough, but your brain doesn't know it yet. You, there's no sense of being full and then you continue to overeat. And how many times, I'm sure you can picture many situations like this where you've eaten whatever, and you're almost hungrier after the meal, which makes no sense. And you continue to overeat. And it's because you're eating too fast. A meal should take at least 15 to 20 minutes to finish. Even longer, even a half hour. That's why you want to take your time to slowly chew, to not rush through it. That way you're going to avoid overeating, having second helpings. Um, You know, how many times have you finished dinner and then you find yourself like, going to the fridge and looking around, it's usually because of that. Um, You know, food choices are going to be related as well, but, you know, keep an eye on how quickly, you know, you're potentially eating. So for the next, you know, the next week or two, however long you take it, I would set up like your phone or your timer or keep an eye on your watch or the clock and make sure you're slowing down. Like if you find yourself, you're like, oh, I'm already halfway done and it's only been three minutes you know, start slowing it down for the rest of it. And that's just going to help you avoid overeating, taking in too many calories, which can obviously lead to excess body fat and things like that. The next tip after that is now to start adding in stuff, but not too much at once. You're going to want at some point in the day, if you're not already doing this, having some form of a super dark green leafy vegetable salad. And these are going to be your best friend as far as how well your body functions to get in that wide variety of vitamins, minerals, phytonutrients, antioxidants. And that's, we get them from a lot of things, but dark green leafy vegetables are your best bet. They are super high in nutrition, but they're very low calorie. And at the same time, they're filled of a lot of those things that will keep you full, like um, fiber and water content and um, that natural roughage and the whole deal. So go with things like, you know, spinach, kale, they're kind of the classics. Um, Swiss chard, you can throw in some cilantro or parsley or, you know, so make some form of this salad and then make sure to have it at least once a day and just get used to having that. The next tip after that is you can start increasing that intake you want to now slowly start replacing anytime you have a grain based dish, whether it's, you know, too much pasta or rice or breads or whatever, you want to replace that with that salad now. And now you can start adding in, you know, if you haven't already start adding in other stuff like, um, you know, cucumbers and cherry tomatoes and bread and 
green bell peppers um, and some and now this is another time where you can start ditching um, different you know like commercial based salad dressings or, or vegetable oils and stuff like that so that would be the next tip is to start using your own making your own salad dressings just use a simple like extra virgin olive oil start using you know like maybe a red wine vinegar vinegar or a balsamic and just mix those together and start using those as like your salad dressings your marinades all that stuff ditch all the vegetable oils sunflower oil safflower oil vegetable all that crap um and from from cooking or the salad dressings or whatever get them all out and start replacing them with the real olive oils those vegetable oils are such a refined and high treated high heat product that they become so inflammatory in your body they're so high of omega 6s from an inferior source potentially genetically modified sources when it comes to you know corn or soy or whatever like that and the way they hit your body is just like i said completely inflammatory they you know picture like when you cut yourself with um, whatever you get a sliver and you just get that you know all that redness and that throbbing my finger is a heartbeat you know that whole deal that same effect is happening inside you when you're eating inflammatory based foods the problem is you don't feel it but it's still having those bad effects and that's you know inflammation is seen as kind of the root of a lot of diseases if not all of them you know according to some people so these vegetable and refined oils are so you know, high heat treated, they're, they're almost degraded down so much that in some cases they have to add in like deodorizers into the oils because they're almost at the rancid stage and eating a rancid food is just probably number one on the do not touch list. And again, like it, it throws your body's natural omega three to omega six balance. And when that's out of whack, that inflammatory process happens. So start getting rid of all those things um, you know, you're increasing the greens um, and vegetable intake through the day and you're using a little more of a natural and healthier, um, you know, salad dressing or marinade or whatever that you can make yourself and they're way cheaper and I think they taste a lot better too. So get, you know, this is worth spending your money on. Get like a really good extra virgin olive oil. You can even get like a good infused one with like garlic or, you know, red chili or wh whatever and just add those in. So that next goal, so now you've added in the salad, you've increased the con uh, the amount you have each day, you're getting rid of the vegetable and the seed oils, and you're adding in the healthy natural ones you're making. And now the next goal is to get up to double-digit servings of non-starchy vegetables each day. So all those, like I said, all those dark leafy greens, all the, you know, the tomatoes, the cucumbers, the red onions, the parsley, the herbs, the whole deal. And... That's, I mean, that sounds like a lot, double digit servings, but when you consider that a serving is not that big, um, you know, that would equal maybe three or four decent size salads with all the, all the, you know, mushrooms, the whole thing you want to throw into it. So it's really not that much. So um, when you're thinking serving sizes, think of like your fist tightly bound up and that sort of area, that amount is, you know, considered sort of one serving size of the vegetable. So, you know, two, three or four of those isn't that much volume and, you know, easy to spread out of the day when you put them all together. So that's the big goal, double digit ser servings of non-starchy vegetables each day. And since now you're replacing the grains you have in a meal with these greens, um, you have all these different opportunities to get a good serving of greens throughout the day. So the next tip is going to be to get more sleep and this is something i cover all the time on the show if you've listened to the episodes you know if not go back and listen i've probably like five or six different ones related just to sleep um, to sum it up the less sleep you get the more you make it difficult difficult for your body to be healthy and to lose weight you increase the amount of stress hormones in your body you throw your metabolism off losing weight is tough. Gaining weight is easy. So the surefire way to, and especially this time of year where things can be stressed and, you know, there's less sunlight and people can, you know, get, you know, the seasonal affective disorder, which is a, a real thing. And 
um, it's tough to get through, you know, after Christmas and the holidays, you know, January, February can be pretty bleak and you're stuck inside all the time. Whenever those stress hormones are up or you run down, this is just when you want to get more sleep. You, you burn those stress hormones off through sleeping. That's when you metabolize them. So if you haven't been getting a lot, try going to bed like an hour earlier um, each day for the next week and a bit. And that can make a big difference. It's going to start with like a wind down process at night. You're going to want to make sure to cut out caffeine after, you know, 2 to 3 p.m., you want to keep your room as dark as possible. You want to avoid electronics and blue light, which can keep you up. And whatever, like whatever nightly routine you have, you want to do it consistently and do it at the same time each day. And that way your body can recognize that sleep is coming and it gets more accustomed to it and you'll fall asleep quicker and you'll stay asleep longer. And that is probably one of the biggest, I'm just going to say it's the biggest thing you can do for your health. Get more sleep, get more recovery, rejuvenative, rejuvenative sleep, and that's going to heal and keep you functioning as best as possible. And it's going to make all those other things you do. It's going to make your diet more effective. If you exercise, it's going to make that more effective. They all sort of feed off each other. So then that, that will be your plan for the next step. Get more sleep. Okay. And then the next habit to add in is now this is a time to eliminate or drastically reduce your sugar intake. So you notice we're starting to like add stuff in. Now these are, you know, and we're starting to take, you know, try to avoid the heavy starchy grains. Now we're wanting to really look, these are like the bigger changes now <clears throat> coming is to get rid of the sugar. I know that's not totally possible. So drastically reduce. So there's no surprise that the horrific increased intake of sugar we've had, the damage it does to your body, how it throws things off hormonally, how it leads to heart disease, type 2 diabetes, obesity. It affects your mood. It leads to um, you know, pancreatic burnout. Your, your body's always pumping out insulin. It's, there's spikes and lows. You're hungrier. You're craving more of this stuff. It's just you know, again, along with, like I said, along with like the sleep thing, cutting out or drastically reducing sugar, the biggest change you can make in the, in the new year here. So the first way to start doing this, um, and it's for some people I get it, 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 this almost seems like impossible, but the first step is to cut back on liquid calories. That's the easiest way we get sugar. You can consume so much of it. You don't have to eat it, digest it. It's just down the hatch. So cut back on drinking your calories through soft drinks, juices, sports drinks, energy drinks, like just that is a massive, massive change. Now you get a little more specific and you're looking at eliminating, say, you know, manufactured and processed foods because they are obviously chock full of sugar. That's what gives them their palatability and makes you crave more of it. So when you can start to, if, if you eat anything out of a packet, you're eating sugar. Even, even breads have sugar. The sugar is everywhere. So the more you can avoid eating things out of a box, and avoid drinking your calories, that's going to be eliminating like 80% of all sugar right there. So that's very doable. And then it's just a matter of, you know, watching the sugars you add in as far as refined like table sugar into your coffee or your tea or your Starbucks or whatever. So start cutting it out in all those places and you'll find it's hidden in a lot of places or in that you add it in each day in these places that you're not even really aware of. So those are the three ways, you know, cutting back on the, the liquid calories, avoiding the refined, uh, you know, table sugars and the added sugar, and then, you know, avoiding all the, anything out of a package If the thing is a list of ingredients on it. It's, you know, probably not the ideal food, like real food is ingredients. Like all those things make up your meals, you know? So that's just the way to look at it. So, the next tip after that, so now, like I said, if you're looking at all these different tips, whether, you know, we've got six, seven, eight different things, if you're doing those for at least a week or at least two weeks, now you've made a lot of these big changes over the course of a few months. And as you're feeling healthier and better, these tougher changes, like if I said at the start, eliminate or drastically reduce sugar all the way. I mean, that can be good, but that that's pretty overwhelming or add in the double digit servings of non-starchy vegetables each day and eliminate all your grains. 
if you haven't been doing that, those are pretty overwhelming things. But when you started slower and more gradual and with more adaptable changes and tips, you know, as you're getting used to those and getting healthier and getting better, these bigger changes are, you're able to tackle them a little more. You're able to go at them because you've already made these great changes already. So one of the last year I would say is to now start getting the best local and organic fruits and vegetables and foods that you possibly can find. So it depends where you live and it depends what's available during the time of year. So, you know, obviously in the dead of winter, I can't get local sweet potatoes because everything is an Arctic tundra right now. But you can still get some of those things from other areas where they're brought in. So start looking for organic versions of those. So organic doesn't always mean it's healthier, but it means it's grown without crap and pesticides and garbage that can still screw up your health. They're still going to be healthier. And a lot of times they are the healthiest option, but organic doesn't, you know, per se mean it's the best choice, but it leads you on your way to way, way better health. So if you can start finding that stuff, and then when you can start finding locally grown organic based, now you're getting the best versions of those food possible. So, you know, as you work your way into getting like real whole foods, if you've gone from eating a lot of manufactured and packaged crap, the first thing you want to do is start getting those real whole foods. So, you know, at the grocery store, that means shopping in the outward perimeter. That's where all the real things are. So don't worry about where they come from, um, if they're organic or whatever. Just focus on getting those real things, whether it's the potatoes or the fruits or the fish or the whatever. And then now later on in the in the whole process, start looking for the best versions of those things, like the organic quality ones. And then from there, try to find those things locally, which shouldn't be hard to do. The amount of like farmer's markets and places like Whole Foods and uh, Whole Foods gets a lot of crap, but it, it's still really good. But your city, I guarantee, has its own version of that in its own smaller private, you know, market based thing. Like I said, the farmer's markets are everywhere and stores that kind of work off that. I, I live in southwestern Ontario, so I mean, this doesn't apply, obviously, outside of here but there is a food store called farm boy which i probably get most of my stuff at because it works with there's probably maybe i don't know that there's even maybe 10 or 12 of them without throughout south southwestern ontario but they were each location works with the farms in that area so there so i'm down here in london ontario i'm not getting whatever vegetables even let's say they're organic and farm grown but they're not coming from Northern Ontario. They're coming from my area here where the person in Northern Ontario at their farm boy, they're getting their stuff from there. So you might have a version like that or just do a Google search and look for either farmer's markets or, you know, real food based little grocery stores. And they're probably doing the exact same thing depending on where you live. It's not a big commercial chain. So they're, you know, trying to source their stuff locally. And these are people who have, a lot of interest in real and good foods. And sometimes they're run by um, people who have done farming and they want to bring that into one place for you. So there's tons of places to get these things. But the main thing is that you like you transition away from, you know, the package and manufacture and process crap into the real whole foods and then the best versions of those foods. And this is the reminder we can all use because we've just spent the last few weeks eating absolute crap. I know I, I, I'm good with it. Like I'm very aware of um, allowing myself stuff and not overindulging. But the fact is we've just been exposed to like the amount of sugar and refined carbs and drinks and alcohol and the whole deal over the holiday season. So we're all in the same boat. So it's about getting back on track together. So as far as health and or sorry, fitness goes <clears throat> now, if you've already been regularly exercising um, and you're consistent with it, this is a good time to now start to switch things up. Your body can get very complacent and very, you remember homeostasis and the idea of balance in the body and your body wants to find the easiest way to do things. And so consistency is the ultimate importance. You want to get started and you want to be consistent to get results. But after a while, that's where you're going to need some variation. So if that's you and you've been very dedicated into the gym, but you've been doing the same things, now's the time to switch things up um, to give your body a different stimulus so it can respond back to get fitter and stronger and leaner and the whole deal. So that can look as simple as just you know changing around the days you work out. It can be 
changing the set and um, repetition ranges. If you're doing like three sets of 10, now's the time where you could do say four sets of 12 to 15. If you've been doing that, you can be doing three sets of six to eight and, you know, go into a little more of a strength phase. You know, when you lower your repetitions down, you're getting into that. You can start doing super setting where you do exercises back to back. You can start doing more of a circuit thing um, so it can keep your heart rate up. You can change the combination of, say, the bot. Say you always go in and do a back and bicep workout. Switch it up and do a back and tricep workout. You know, just very simple things. And these make big changes. This is also the time you can start looking at different, you know, other forms of activity, you know, maybe start doing yoga if you haven't before or high intensity interval training or, you know, boot camp classes or try using like the rowing machine instead of the treadmill, the gym, like that just start switching it up and anything you do that's a little bit different is going to be that stimulus your body needs. So remember the best workout is the one you haven't done yet. So that's why you always want to make those little variations and do at least what you did the workout before. If you did 30 minutes on the elliptical machine, do 31 the next time. Just those constant little changes, you know, and, and you can push yourself and try different things because you might find um, certain skills that you didn't know you had. Like if you join, say, like a beginner squash league, you might be amazing and you dominate at squash, which is an incredible workout, or swimming. So start that variation. If you're brand new to fitness again it goes with the same thing with building the behavioral changes starting slow and building if you've been sitting on a couch and haven't exercised since high school and you go out and try and do crossfit five times a week it's going to decimate you so you want to again start small start with even just like simple walking you know if it's available depending on the weather i don't know if i'm going to get out of the studio today honestly but if it's you know say just three days a week take monday wednesday friday and just do like a 15 to 20 minute walk. It's enough that it's going to give you a little bit of health benefits, but it's not going to be overwhelming and it's not going to leave you dead not wanting to do it again. It's ideally going to leave you wanting to do more. So you got that Monday, Wednesday, Friday. And then after a few weeks, you're going to go for, you know, 22 minutes, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, and then 25 and then 30 and then up to 40, up to the point where you're, you're doing like an hour's walk three times a week, which is very doable. Now you can start spreading it out. Do, you know, Monday through Friday and do, you know, 25 minutes each day. And then you can build that up. You know, start gradual. You don't have to be in the gyms yet. There's time for all that sort of stuff if you're brand new, you know, in just adding in hiking or going swimming or if you're playing tennis or whatever. You can get a lot more specific later on. That's why I don't want to, I can get into more fitness stuff on a different show because that's, you know, entire podcast just on the specifics of training and whatever, but it's not about, you know, overwhelming things right at the start. So if you're brand new, starting slow, gradually building, if you've been doing it for a while, now's the time for change and variation. Okay. This is the last thing I want to finish on when it comes to fitness and new years and the whole deal. If you've been working out consistently and you're in the gyms, you know, this time of year is pretty chaotic the floodgates open and gyms are taken over by an abundance of new members wherever you go to get fit these crowds come in it starts to get you know tough to navigate getting onto certain machines or there's lineups or there's signups to get on the cardio it becomes overcrowded you know classes are turning away people so there's ways around this the first thing i want to say is Not that you'd be like that, but don't be that person that makes a new person feel uncomfortable. Don't be that D-bag that, I don't know, looks down or is, you know, people are in your way. And like these people are, you know, they're brand new. They're trying to make healthy changes in their lives. And what kind of welcoming atmosphere is that when it's all these like asshats who are just, you know, saying, oh, you're doing that wrong. When will you be done? You're what you're, t-, you know, just making them feel it's almost like bullying them in a sense. But think back to the first time you stepped foot in the gym and you didn't know what to do and you didn't know where things were and you're kind of wandering aimlessly. That's these people. So put yourself in their shoes and you know what? Be that friendly face and help them out. Or if you have a second, be like, oh, here's, you know, not a better way to do this, but 
show them how the machine works if they're looking stuck on it or if they're having trouble on like the cardio controls. Think how much you would have appreciated that at the time, um, you know, when you started, just someone to help you out, you know, and then it's the potential for um, new friends and just to, I don't know, just to create more of that. Gyms can be such a gong show. I've worked in so many and some have great vibes and some have terrible vibes and I don't know, just make, help create an environment that's more conducive to, I don't know, people getting results and better energy and that whole deal. So I just, I know it's, it's something I find if you're the experienced person in the gym is, is helping the newbie out just because of how much they'll appreciate that. And again, like thinking of when you were maybe in their shoes. So if, and I I do understand it is frustrating. Um, I know (laughs) I have friends that will do, this is funny, like depending on the gym you go to, some of them will have sign up forms for the cardio, you know, you can only do half hour blocks at a time. And there's, you know, the time and the wait list and when you can jump on it. And sometimes they're so full. I have a friend who takes, she prints off at home an out of order sign and tapes it onto the cardio machine she uses. So no one touches a thing. And then she'll go to it, jump on and it's fine because you know, too much is going on, which is, I don't know, actually probably pretty smart. So for, if you do get frustrated and I understand with how packed the gyms are, some days, um, drove in the other day and there was generally like when the weather's good, I try to like bike or walk to the gym, but you know, I do drive. I went in one day and there were zero parking spots. Uh, sometimes you just can't even get into the place. So to navigate this kind of crazy time of year, I would say, here's a few tips. So first one, start working out earlier in the day. This is good for a few reasons. I mean, early morning workouts can help set you up for success through the day. It's going to help your energy levels. It's going to help, you know, getting that endorphin released early in the day. It's going to help with your mood. It's going to help with your productivity, your creativity. Actually, it's even going to help you sleep better at night um, because it sort of starts that circadian rhythm, which allows it to sort of transition and taper off. So um, what you do early in the day can impact your sleep at night. Busiest time in the gyms, obviously 5 to 9 p.m. So they're going to be packed to the high gills, whatever that is. So when you go in the morning, you're going to, you know, avoid a bit of that chaos. Um, You're going to get things done quick and you're going to be out of there. The next um, thing I would say for tip is um, to avoid the, the whole crowded gym atmosphere is take your exercise outside if doable. This can be doing like some brisk runs, hikes, finding, you know, places with stairs to do running, you know, obviously if this is more doable, it's, it's just good to get outside as you know, with the gyms are more crowded, germs are more spread. There's more sweat. Here's the number one fitness tip I can give you in January. Wash your hands when you leave the gym, even during seriously, this is the number one health tip, fitness tip I can give so that you can stay healthy and still be in the gym, you know, when you're wiped out sick, there's not a lot of activity you're going to be able to do. So, um, you know, even keep a sanitizer around. It's just, it's so hard when it's cold, everyone's cooped up inside. You're more exposed to everyone's germs, um, sweat, you know, everything like that. So it's, you know, if you can get outside during this time of year, you're going to avoid all that. You're at least going to get some decent, you know, air and you're going to, you know, help yourself, but just honestly wash your hands when you're done working out and <laughs> that'll enable you to continue working on and not be, um, flat on your back for a couple of weeks with the flu. The next tip I'd say, if you're worried about the whole crowded gym thing is take a week off from the gym in, you know, the start of January. So like I said, the, the initial rush tends to, based on every gym I've worked in, the initial rush tends to taper off around the third week. Um, it's almost a perfect science, honestly. And then, like I said, a majority of all those people by March are long gone. Like I said, it's only 8% that usually stick with it. And again, because they're doing too much. If you want to be that person who sort of, you know, busts through that again, start it slow. And then by the time March rolls around, you're sort of just getting into it and, you know, hopefully more motivated and, and excited to keep going with it. So, you know, that's the secret there, but generally around that third week, is when that that huge surplus of people tapers off a bit. So if you've been, you know, training hard and going hard through Christmas and the holidays and the whole deal, this could be a good time to take a week away from the gym. And I know that sounds like 
I don't know, a nightmare potentially if you like it. And I get it. Um, but it's going to do your favor if you want to avoid all these crowds. It's a good time to also take, you know, that opportunity to let your body completely rest and heal so that when you come back, you're maybe, you know, a lot of times you're stronger um, than when you left, which seems weird. But it's just when you're constantly breaking down muscle tissue, exerting yourself, it, it, it you know, it takes a toll on your body, your immune system, the whole deal. And, and another reason why you can potentially get sick easily. Um, so it's a good time to, you know, like recharge your central nervous system, give it, you know, give yourself a little more mental focus. I, I say every three to four months of tra- I do this all the time. Every three to four months of straight training or activity you do, I always say take around five to seven days completely off just to get that extra rest, just to get everything recovered. I did it from January 1st to the 7th. I took that whole time off. I usually do that around um, Christmas every year. Like I'll work out right up till Christmas, even like Boxing Day, stuff like that. But I always plug in that extra week there. So it'll be good to help you come back stronger. You can avoid a bit of that overcrowdedness. Um, so yeah, that, that's that's just the way I see it. So I don't know if those are helpful to you, but that's just what I wanted to end on uh, about you know the, the state of fitness in January. So hopefully all these things are helpful to you that you're able to implement if you are already on track with things maybe they're a good refresher so hopefully i've helped you in whatever state you're at right now so thanks for listening like i said if you haven't already make sure to subscribe wherever you get your podcast that way you automatically get it sent to you each week if you have any more questions on stuff like that or even if you're looking for i do online nutrition coaching so if that's something you're looking for as far as getting, you know, everything dialed in and having that coaching aspect and that accountability and that education, that whole deal, give me a, you can do two things. You can check out, um, on my website, a little more detail and stuff. So that's regainwellness.com slash coaching. And if you want even more info or you want to share some of your stuff, you can write to me at info at regained wellness dot com and i'll put up links for different stuff i've talked about or just you know everything on the show notes which will be regainwellness.com slash one four zero so if you're new to podcasts that's kind of the after party where anything i've talked about or more you know if i've I've referenced other things like different podcasts i've done like on the sleep thing or other things i think you might be interested in that's where you go to so for this episode regainwellness.com slash one four zero. Thank you for listening. I appreciate it. Happy new year. Talk to you soon.